Well, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone today? Amazing. Good. Doing well? Good. Awesome. Well, welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're looking and listening online today, watching us on our Facebook live feed, please say hi that you, we know that you're with us here this morning. This is Palm Sunday, which is the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, we won't be having our Wednesday night uh, Bible study, but we will be having Friday, Good Friday service. So yesterday we had Iron Sharpens Iron down in the Quad Cities. We had a good group of people went down there. Um, you know, I, it was just awesome, absolutely mind-blowing to see 1,200 men come together in one room to praise the Lord. And it was, it was a great day, to say the least. Um, and we had, uh, we had donuts on the way down, and I was talking to Bruce, and I told Bruce, I said, you know, donuts are the perfect church food because they're holy, right? <laughs> Wow, tough crowd. Wow, tough crowd. Man, I'm telling you. I got it. Woo. I got it. Okay. Okay. We're sleeping. Well, next <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go back, get some of them palms and kind of whisk people into attendance here this morning. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And as it is Palm Sunday, we have a lot to rejoice. We have Christ entering the city today to, to begin Holy Week and that promise of good things to come thereafter. Uh, speaking of good things to come thereafter, next Sunday, obviously, then is Easter Sunday. And we are going to be having a breaking of the fast here, a breakfast here. And uh, if you're going to bring food in, we ask that you have it here by 8 o'clock because we have to transform this place, get it set up for eating. And then uh, we're going to eat at 9 o'clock in the service at 10 o'clock. Um, we'll be having pancakes and sausage and biscuits and gravy, juice, coffee, eggs, egg casserole, those kind of things. So if there's things you'd like to bring, let us know. Um, we have the pancakes, the sausage, and the biscuits and gravy already uh, taken care of. So the rest of it, uh, we have coffee over there. Uh, the rest of it, if you'd like to bring something in, kind of potluck type thing, uh, please let us know ahead of time so we know what to expect for food. And uh, uh, let us know if you're going to be here so we know how much food to prepare for everybody. Next up on the list is we have Good Friday service this Friday at 7 o'clock. And uh, so we're uh, going to have a, a nice Good Friday service here. And uh, hopefully you all can attend. And then Orange Track Racing, six, season 18. April 8th already, we have another one. It just seems like we just had one like a week or two ago. Um, but we have Orange Track <laughs> Racing in here and then Easter Sunday. So we have the Easter service and the breakfast before the service. Uh, so let's go to God and open our time of worship with prayer. Gracious and loving Father, we praise you and thank you for this day. And we've waited in each eager anticipation of this coming during this Lenten season. We've prepared our hearts for this day and we've prepared for the message that you've given to Pastor Terry uh, to share with us today. And we know, Lord, uh, and we lift those people up to you today who are grieving and who have had loss in their family. And we lift Pastor Terry and his family up with the loss of his father. And Lord, for those who are home and can't be with us today because either they're traveling or they have a sickness um, or injuries. Lord, we lift them up as well and we just ask for you to surround them with your loving care, your kindness, your healing, and your peace today. So Father God, we praise you and thank you for being in this room with us right now here as we are gathered together in your name. And you, your word tells us that where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are amongst us. And we praise you and thank you for that today. Open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive your message today. Open our eyes to see the wonderful blessings that you give around us each and every day. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Terry is for the call to worship today. Has uh, chosen Zechariah 9.9. And that comes from the New Living Translation. And it says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. 
Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, and yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Now, when Zechariah wrote this, it was a promise that God was sending a messianic king to bring peace to his people. And this prophet was written by Zechariah 540 years before Christ was born. Jesus was sending this message of hope to the Israelite people. The Israelites in exile had returned to Judah under the lenient policy of Cyrus the Great. And he was the emperor of Persia at the time. They returned to a land with few Jewish leaders, little money, no temple, and no priesthood. Or perhaps one viewed as illegitimate by the returnees. And moreover, they had little hope. And so God saw the people and he saw what they were returning to in the land. And he sent this message of hope for those peasants living in Judah. See, they had been left behind to cultivate the lands of their former masters. And they were again in bondage to someone else. They lived in the shadows of their masters and they needed that sign of hope, a foretelling of what was to come. So God sent this message to Zechariah to give to the people. See, it had been 587 years then, later, since that prophecy that God gave Zechariah, that Jesus was fulfilling that prophecy as he rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey. The Savior of the people, held yet again in bondage, living in the shadow of the Roman occupiers at this time. He was bringing hope to the Israelites to free them from the bondage that they were subjected to. But see, the freedom that he was freeing them from, the bondage he was freeing them from was sin. They were looking for someone to free them from the Romans. And so the story of Holy Week begins. And so as we come into this time today, we ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he brings this message. Of Jesus weeps as we begin the Holy Week this week. Let us pray. Lord, we just ask that you would anoint Pastor Terry in his message today. Strengthen him. Give him the courage and give him the strength to give us that message here today. And Lord, we just ask that as we start this week of Holy Week, that we put a special emphasis on our daily lives. For you help us to bring you to the forefront of our lives not sitting in the back room in the back corner where we may give you a minute or two each day or just make us bring you up front and center during this week bring your message to us a message of hope a message of restoration a message of deliverance christ the savior Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today is an extremely special day as we celebrate Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. 
And little did I know that the title of this sermon would have such a different meaning to me today. As we go through the service today, we're going to be talking about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem as the king. And this is such an amazing thing, but we will get to a point where we're also going to hear how Jesus wept over Jerusalem. <coughs> and you might find me weeping a little bit today for a couple reasons. One, because this is a powerful scripture. This is a powerful message that God has given us. But yesterday morning, we also said goodbye to I said goodbye to my dad. First day of the week. I literally wrote this before this all happened. This week will be, for believers, a roller coaster of emotions. And it's, I had to explain that to Mark this morning. He goes, How you doing? I said, Like this. It's a roller coaster of emotions. Today we start the week with happiness and joy and excitement and expectation. Today we celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now, we see many ways of making an entrance. Sometimes you'll see somebody make an entrance and they don't realize there's a door and they run right into it. If you watch TV, maybe you've seen some of those cop shows that are on. Well, they break down doors to make an entrance. <laughs> Sometimes it's a criminal entry. They pick the lock or break a window to make their entrance. I love watching sporting teams come into the floor or onto the floor, whether it's if that's basketball or onto the field, if it's baseball or football. <laughs> I grew up a huge <coughs> Chicago Bulls fan, so in my head, I can't hum it for you, I can't say the words that the announcer says to you, because they're in my head, and they're playing, and I can see the lights and everything happening in the Bulls stadium, or in their, on their court. I can also see a picture of Caitlin Clark leading her Iowa Hawkeye team onto the floor. They've made it to the, not just to the final four, but to the championship game, and that'll be later today. We see concerts, and they've got, I mean, when I first started going to concerts, you know, they'd walk on the stage, and that would be the thing, right? Well, now they have these floors that come up, and they come up, and they're, all of a sudden, they're there, and they're all this smoke and everything, you know, there's all these things that are happening. There's also entrances at weddings. There's this great pomp and circumstance. Sometimes the guys will already be standing up there waiting for the bride to come up. Sometimes they make an entrance from behind a screen. But what happens when the bride gets ready to come up? We get this really special music and the bride comes up. There's other times that you make an entrance. Now, I used to uh, come home from work and say, come home. Now I come upstairs from my basement <laughs> office. It's not much of an entrance. The entrance that I may make at that point is just stumbling up the steps. But none of that compares to the entry that Jesus makes into Jerusalem. Our passage for today will be coming from Luke 19, 28 through 40, and we'll be going through this in pieces with some other scriptures interspersed within it. But this passage or this section starts with verse 28 saying, After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. Now this story that he had just told was the parable of the ten servants, or depending on your uh, translation, I might say, ten minus. 
And Luke tells us in verse 11 that Jesus told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. That's important. And we'll get more into that in a moment. But the kingdom of God would not begin right away. Jesus would tell many stories and parables from this point on to prepare the disciples to carry on the ministry. He was preparing. He knew what was to come. He knew that he was going to be beaten and nailed to a cross and die a horrific death, but that death would be to save us. Luke continues in verse 29 by saying, As he came to the towns of Bethpage, which I have yet to find any documentation of where Bethpage actually exists. But you know what? With all of the archaeological finds that are happening, I got to imagine at some point, because they just found the five pools not too long ago. So I got to imagine Bethpage is going to be found soon. And then he continues and says, And Bethany on the Mount of Olives. This was a village that was about two miles from Jerusalem and home to Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. Luke continues by saying, he sent two disciples ahead. I hear Jesus' words here. He says, go into that village over there. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say the Lord needs it. Now, did he prearrange that? A lot of people are going to come out and say it, especially those who aren't believers are going to say, nope. He, he, that's prearranged. He already told them that that was the case. But here's the thing. The disciples were always with him. They would have known that. So it wasn't prearranged. And this is where we see resources that are being made available to a king. That donkey had never been used. That meant it was good for sacred use. And there's a couple of references that we can find in the Old Testament about this. In Numbers 19.2, it says, Here is another legal requirement commanded by the Lord. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer, a perfect animal that has no defects, and has never been yoked to a plow. By never having been used, the Lord will use it. First Samuel 6, 7, in the second part of this verse, it says, Now build a new cart, and find two cows that have just given birth to calves. Make sure the cows have never been yoked to a cart. These made them holy, and they made them for a king. Luke continues in verse 32 saying, So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, Why are you untying that colt? Now, if this had been prearranged, why would they ask that question? And the disciples simply replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. This, while well, we see this happening, you know, like on, for celebrities and that when they roll out the red carpet, right? This is an ancient version of rolling out the red carpet for the king, for Jesus. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful things miracles they had seen. <coughs> this is a fulfillment of a 500 year old prophecy. The scripture that Mark read for our call to worship this morning, I talked about it a little bit. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph. O people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey. I have to imagine that this was like the final four games that we just saw played out. 
I gotta imagine this is what it was like in Iowa City, even with the destruction from the the tornadoes that went through Coralville in that area. People could still gather together and they celebrated. It had to have been deafening. It had to have been so loud. That's what it would have been like as Jesus came in. People lined on both sides as he's walking or riding that colt. Now, just unlike a sporting event, they know why they're there. They're there to cheer on their team, right? They're there to have a good time and enjoy that. But some of the people that were in this crowd that were uh, waving their palm branches or throwing their garments on the ground for him to ride across, they were kind of like caught up in the moment. They had no idea what was going on. But hey, it looked like fun. It looked exciting. Let's shout. Let's make all kinds of noise. The thing is, is that cheering that was going on in that moment, as he was riding into Jerusalem, that cheering would go from this jubilant cheering to a much different kind of cheering by the end of the week. The Messiah, the King of Israel, that's what they thought was coming. They thought they had this king who was a fighting kind of king. He was going to be like David. He was going to come in and shake things up. Sorry to say they had the wrong idea. They hadn't been paying attention for the last three years. They had not been truly listening to the words that Jesus had been speaking. They had not truly been paying attention to the scriptures. They were caught up in the moment and were favorable for Jesus, at least for the day. Sometimes we cause the favor of others to be lost ourselves. Sometimes it's, it's in the hands of others. That's why there were so many others there that really had no clue and were cheering on. But the Messiah came in on a donkey. It was an animal of a peaceful man, not a warrior. This brings us to verse 38, where... This is the shouting that was going on. And they had their palm branches. And if you've got yours and you want to wave it, let's do that. He's, they were saying, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. More or less, they were saying, long live the king. They had no idea how true that would be because Jesus is eternal. Notice that Luke does not use Hosanna like the other three Gospels. Had it a little differently. Likely because Luke was a Gentile writing about Jesus. And he would not have had the same understanding of the term Hosanna. Little side note here, there is not an English word for the Greek of Hosanna, so the translators simply sounded it out. It's kind of like Yahweh in the Old Testament, no vowels, sound it out, trying to get what we have. The Greeks did the same thing with the Hebrew of Hosanna. In the Old Testament, it meant to save or please or, or even rescue. But by the time Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it meant salvation is here. It is a shout of joy and of jubilation. It is a reconciliation between us and God. It is a peace on earth that awaits Christ. Luke continues in verse 39 by saying, But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke 
You are followers for saying things like that. And he replied, if they kept secret, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. And I think of the Jesus rocks we have in the back. If we were to be quiet, when we get ready to worship today, if we are quiet, I can almost, it's almost like those rocks would start rattling in the basket that they're in and they would crowd and they would cheer. Nothing's beyond God. Basically, the Pharisees were saying to the people, shh, you'll upset the Romans. You ever heard somebody say that to you? Shh, don't say that. You'll make them upset. You'll make them mad. They didn't want a war. They wanted their lives to continue as they are because they were profiting off the people. They also thought, or they also thought that the people, excuse me, that were out of line. They felt that by doing what they were doing, lining the road, putting down their garments, waving the branches, and hollering out, that they were disrespecting God. They needed to go back and reread the scriptures that they claimed to know so well. They, what they weren't comprehending and putting together was that Jesus was introducing the kingdom of God. then would not everything, not just the people, not just the rocks, but all of the <coughs> creation burst into cheers. This should be the greatest celebration ever. Bigger than a birthday party, bigger than a wedding, bigger than what the celebration if the Hawkeye women win today. <laughs> Iowa City is going to be a bigger mess than what it was after the tornado. That should pale in comparison to the celebration that we should have with Jesus introducing us into the kingdom. Yet in the coming verses, Luke will record that Jesus wept. So what makes you cry? <coughs> Any more commercials? I have no idea what they're for. Back in the 70s, McDonald's could make you cry in a commercial. <laughs> Hallmark could make you cry in a commercial. A movie or a book could make you cry depending on what you're reading. Certainly relationship issues can make you cry. So can the loss of a loved one. It is okay to cry. And men, women, I know you're okay with crying. This is specifically for the men and boys. It's okay to cry. Let out that emotion. Because if you bottle it in, you're only hurting yourself. And here, here Romans 12, 15. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. I wonder if this is why I'm a sympathy <laughs> prayer. I take this to heart. But if Jesus can cry, why can't we? Three times in the New Testament we read that Jesus wept. Twice in the Gospels and one time in the Epistles. So once was after Lazarus' death. The shortest verse in the Bible, it comes from John 11.35, Jesus wept. Some translations just say, he wept. Shortest verse in the Bible and powerful. Hebrews 5, 7. While Jesus was on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Think about the prayers that Jesus prayed. And some of the most powerful prayers happened where? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke is the only gospel writer to record Jesus weeping as he gets to 
to Jerusalem. And this section from Luke 19 verses 41 through 44 is, in most Bibles it says, Jesus wept or Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. Saying, how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. <clears throat> he, Jesus, was so focused on us that he hurt. He hurt for us. Hurt to the point, it says, he is praying in the garden before he is arrested. That blood comes from his body. I have never seen or heard of such anguish. And he wasn't just worried about his disciples or a few people in Jerusalem or the people of Israel. This was far reaching. This was for everyone from before he came to when he returns again. And I have to imagine he will still weep over those who choose to not believe who he is. This is, you're not going to read this in the scriptures. I imagine when Jesus returns and he comes into his kingdom and everything is said and done and we join him in eternity, he will still weep over those who chose again. That is a burden that I personally don't think I could bear. I see people out and about and I see things happening in the world and my heart hurts for them, but not even, it pales in comparison to the way God feels. When Jesus wept, it was more than one thing that he had on his mind. It was us. I get this feeling. I understand a little bit how he felt. As I looked and prayed with my family yesterday, I was worried about them and how they were dealing with it. He also had on his mind a trial that was to come. He knew he was going to be taken into custody, and he went with them. And he went through quite a bit. <coughs> we'll talk about that more later. He knew that he was going to be beaten. Now, we kid about guys not taking pain real well, you know. Getting a cold is like being near death. Things of that nature. <laughs> Women like to laugh about that. Diane's about ready to fall out of her chair. <laughs> this is a beating that no one, not even y'all women who have given childbirth and no pain more than men, we men will ever know, if you couldn't even withstand this type of pain. We'll talk more about that later this week. But he also had on his mind his death on And I can still, I, you know, it's been 20 years since the Passion of the Christ came out. I got to see it on February 24th, 2004. I guess it's 19 years. And I can see, and it was very graphic, I can see the hand and, and the, the holding the nail and the hammer coming down. I'll just leave it there because it gets rather graphic. 
But he knew that that would happen, and then he knew what was worse was that he was going to get put up on that cross and that he would suffocate. Not be, not wouldn't be from the pain or anything else, that he would be suffocated. See, in 2 Corinthians 5.15, it says, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. He came, he lived, and he died for us. Over the last <clears throat> month, several, 16 months, I've had an opportunity to spend even more time with my dad. And you know what his concern was? Was it himself? Yeah, he didn't like his disease, and yeah, he... he wish that they could do something and all these different things, but what was his concern? Here's my, now he's a planner, he's an engineer, so you can imagine. Check, you know, got that checklist, got to get everything done. And it was all about, do I have everything in place to make it easy for you when I'm gone? How many of us have gone through a family death where nothing was planned, you have no idea where anything is at, and life becomes a giant mess. <clears throat> There's a few things I'm still a little fuzzy about, but we'll figure it out because he made sure. And it wasn't just that, he was always, it was always about taking care of other people and doing things for other people. He was a workaholic, and I claim that I'm a workaholic because of him. But when it came to family, he stopped it all. He said, pause, I've got a game to go to. I've got a track meet. I've got a band concert. He put family first. Jesus also had on his mind that the people would want war, that they would want him to raise up an army to go up against the Romans and to wipe the Romans out. He knew the people would not understand the way to peace, his peace. He knew the unrest with the Romans would continue even to the point where he prophesied the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That even most of Jerusalem would be destroyed. As we saw Wednesday night in the, one of the videos, the only thing left of the temple is a wall with some steps. And that's where uh, he was standing as he was teaching his message to the people that were there and, and to those of us. Now, I, I'm a stickler for detail, and I noticed that some of the people had these little earpieces in. And I, my mind is going, oh, somebody's translating for them. So the people could hear the message. It wouldn't be like when Peter gets up and preaches, and they hear the message in their own language. Flavius Josephus would record the Roman siege of Jerusalem in War of the Jews. Four years of war. Jesus knew this was coming. He knew that 600,000 Jews would die. God's kingdom was being introduced to them. And Israel did not recognize it. He labored. I can't even imagine. I know how my mind gets when it's all well, one of my favorite terms, and Lori used it this morning, discombobulated. <laughs> it's like wires running everywhere. Oh wait, that's my wife's mind. That's what happens when you marry a preacher. He also had on his mind that salvation was being offered by God himself, and it was being refused. 
Oh. Why would you refuse something that great? And then my mind starts to wonder, what if I was back then? How would I have tripped? Where would I have been? Where would I have fallen? The people had rejected Jesus. They have rejected God's grace, God's mercy, and his salvation. If you were Jesus, wouldn't you weep too? Just as Jesus looked at the faces of those in the crowd, he looks at each of us as well. What does he see? What are we preoccupied by? Work? Family? Depending on your age, school? Politics? What is it that we are preoccupied by? And does he see a group of people that know him? I think he does, but I think he sees another group of people that have no clue. And I wonder as he looks, is he still weeping? Will he be ready when you go to see him? Will he be ready to look at you and say, well done, good, faithful servant? Several years ago, my mom and dad came to visit. And I took them down into our family room in the basement one at a time. And I sat them both down because I had to know the answer. Because I wondered. I said, Mom. And when Dad came down, I said, Dad, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Your personal Savior? And they both said, so when my mom slipped away seven and a half years ago, when my dad slipped away yesterday morning, I knew Jesus was ready to say to both of them, well done, good and faithful servant. My tears, while I miss the heck out of them, are tears of joy. So when Jesus weeps, <coughs> He doesn't just weep over those who don't choose him. He weeps over those who do out of joy. This Sunday, we will celebrate our resurrected Christ. We will come to church. People will come to churches all over to hear a message from the Gospels that will give us hope. Yes, today we celebrate Palm Sunday. We cheer Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem. Friday, we are brokenhearted because of his death. But on Sunday, Sunday we'll celebrate. Palm Sunday reminds us of the day <coughs> when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey as prophesied in the Old Testament in Isaiah and Zechariah. And it is on this day that Jesus would have been revered as a king, as we <coughs> talked about, whom people believed would free them from Roman rule. Jesus did come to free them, but not from the Romans. Instead, he came to free us from our sins and to offer us eternal life. That's why you'll see some churches that have an eternal flame. I remember growing up, Methodist church, you got this gold ornate candle holder and inside is this big candle and growing up that candle was real and it was the pastor's job to make sure that candle didn't go out today a lot of them are electric or battery operated still got to make sure they don't go out but it's a representation of that eternal flame of eternal life <laughs> Mark said during announcements, we invite you to join us on Friday evening at 7 o'clock for a Good Friday service. And then to join us 
Easter morning, as we break the fast with the meal, and then we have a celebration worship service. Merciful God, as we enter into this holy week, turn our hearts against, or turn our hearts again to Jerusalem and to the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. You promised salvation through the Messiah, and today we remember that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies of our promised Redeemer. We acknowledge our need for salvation from our sins and rejoice that Jesus is our deliverer. We celebrate him today as king and ask that his kingdom come in our lives too. We praise you now and will praise you throughout the coming week, months, and years until we meet you face to face. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into this time of communion this morning, as we are gathering together in communion with one another, I invite you to remember, because we are called as part of our communion to remember what's going on. And, and in Pastor Terry's message, he talked about Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying and he's weeping. And, but he is praying fervently, as it says. So fervently, capillaries break, and he's bleeding. He's praying so hard. <coughs> See, he's weeping because the people who were introduced to Jesus when he was born. I'm going to take you back to there real quick. Because he was called Emmanuel, God with us. 36 years these people had been hearing that Jesus was God with us from a moment of his birth. And now they're shouting Hosanna as he comes in. They're, they're declaring this great thing that's about to happen. That the Christ is there. Christ means Savior. That's what it translates to. So Jesus Christ, Jesus our salvation, Jesus our Savior is coming. But they were thinking it was for the wrong reason. They missed the point. For 36 years they had the opportunity to know Jesus as the Son of God. God with us. Living amongst us. I would say he's got pretty good reason to weep. A pretty good reason to weep. So as we come into this time of communion today, we're drawn to the cross. And especially because it is a holy week, we're drawn to remember the events of this week. His entrance, his triumphant entrance into the city. Hosanna, great things are about to happen. That's what that means. Hosanna. This is a celebration. It's a celebration. And if you got it, and if you knew who Jesus was, you had a real reason to celebrate. So later on, he had a meal with the disciples. And in that meal, he took bread and he broke it. And he was exclaiming to them, not explaining, exclaiming to them with the bread, this is my body which is broken for you. That week, that body would be broken, whipped and beaten and carried across. Likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup and he filled it and he blessed it. And he said, this is, the this is the cup of the new covenant. This is the new deal I'm bringing to you. God amongst you. This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This cup washes you clean. It washes those sins away. I'm taking those sins from you. And I'm taking those stripes upon my back so that you can receive Christ, the Savior, Jesus, amongst us. The body and the blood of Christ broken for you, shed for you, so that you can be free from sin. 
The scripture tells us that he will not eat of the bread or drink of the cup until he comes back to join amongst us. So he gives us that promise of all is not lost. I'm coming back and I'm taking you home to be with me. Hope for the ages. I love these classes. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. As we come into this time of prayer this morning, we lift up those who can't be with us here today, whether they're traveling, whether they're at home ill uh, or injured, or if they're at a time of loss in their lives and we, they have special need today. And we lift up that need, especially. We lift up their hearts to God today. And we want to meet those needs. We want God to enter in and be their savior to bring them restoration. We're going to talk about restoration and transformation next Sunday. Because he got up. That's the great news. He got up. So in this time of prayer today, are there people here who need special prayers? Anyone who okay. prayers for our family? Yes, absolutely. Well, then let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, we just come before you today, and we claim your healing works. We claim your mighty power. We claim your mighty healing deeds. You are the great physician, Lord. Come into these people's hearts that may be broken from a loss of a loved one, their family. We ask a special blessing upon the Van White family for the loss of Al. And yet we claim this as a victory because Al knew you. He had a personal relationship for him. He's up there smiling and looking down. He's no longer in pain. He can breathe again in your presence, Lord. We praise you and thank you for that. We mourn his loss and we thank you that he is in your presence. Lord, for Steve and Denise as they're going through uh, some health issues in here, we ask for healing for Steve uh, from that operation that he had. We just ask that you would remove that pain from him. And for the bronchitis and things that are going through their family right now, Lord, we ask for a restoration to their bodies. We ask, Lord, that you would do a mighty work in their lives. For all those who are out there and we we lift up the prayer list that we had on Wednesday night for those who are down in writing and, and we pray for them each and every day. We pray for their restoration in their lives to come back to you and to have a relationship with you, Lord God. For those who are traveling, we ask for travel mercies. We ask that your presence would be with them as they are coming out and going back. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless them in these endeavors. Restore their families together. Give them that hope. Lord, we ask a special blessing upon us as we go into this Holy Week this week that we would understand, that you would open our minds to understand the message that you are giving us in these scriptures, Lord, of what it means to have Christ as our Savior, as Jesus can come into our lives repair our brokenness, restore our relationship with you, bring us back into righteousness with you, Lord God. We thank you for the promises that you give us, the blessings that you give us each and every day. And we pray today that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus that we can have restoration with you. We praise you and thank you in all these things and claim them as a victory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> you know what I'm pissed this morning the most? <coughs> my dad was usually the first one online, so I good morning. Mm -hmm. I almost brought his phone. <laughs> I 
left out the bass part, just so I could sing one more time. Here's the blessing. Mark said he's no longer in pain. He can breathe again. He's reunited with his family. He is with his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, sitting in the presence of God. And this is how he was ushered there. At 20 minutes to 1, Saturday morning, he pressed his button, and the CNA came in. Her name is Leah. And to our family, she is an angel sent by God. Leah was talking with him. He was talking. He was lucid. But he was saying that I'm not, my oxygen's out. I'm not getting it. He's on a machine that was continuous, so... That wasn't there. She went and got the nurse. She came down, hooked up his CPAP, and put that in. He still didn't feel like he was getting enough air. But he was still talking. He was still conversing with Leah. And then he started to lay back, and she helped him lay down as they continued to talk. And then he drifted off into sleep. As Leah, thank you, Lord, prayed with, and as he passed over him, That makes this prayer that we've been praying throughout this Lent season that much more powerful today. As we close our online portion of our service, pray with me. Lord God in heaven, I pray for you to move against the forces of evil. Lord God, I ask that by your mighty power that you would bind Satan and all his minions from every aspect of our lives, as well as those of our family and of our church family. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, bind all the forces of darkness and disband them with your light. Throw the enemy forces into confusion, hampering their plans and shutting down their schemes so that they will not prosper in their rebellion against you and we, your people. I pray that any and all support of those who do evil in your sight would be dissolved. I pray that their hard hearts would be softened and that they would turn to you, Father God, and that they would be made right in your sight throughout the salvation that comes through accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, let us have eyes to see past the deception of the enemy, and instead of rebellion, there would be repentance. Draw us ever closer to you, Father. Open our <coughs> eyes to see that you are the King of kings, the Lord of hosts, the commander of heaven's armies, the most High God. Lord, send your warning and protecting angels to surround us and protect us from all evil. I pray that all the forces of evil that are working against the efforts of Grace Street Church, our church family, and our friends and family would be bound away and that they would be overcome by your mighty power. Lord Jesus, we claim this as a victory in your name. And we know that by calling on your name that you will protect us. All glory honor and praise to you forever and ever in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. And all God's people said,